So uh, TEXA is one of those organisations that takes its charter so seriously that this year you don't just get one keynote, they're risk mitigating and you get two. Uh, and the second keynote will be someone who requires very little introduction, so I'm going to be very brief. It's Glyn Davis, the Vice-Chancellor of Melbourne University, or University of Melbourne, as I should say. Thanks, Glyn. Thank you. And the tweet said that it was very Hollywood up here, which I now can see firsthand, and that's almost enough to disguise that you have a second man with white hair in a suit about to talk to you. Um, but congratulations to Texas. To get 850 people interested in higher education and spending this time here is just wonderful. Um, I'm here to, to do a bit of big picture talking. I'm going to scare the life out of you and then hopefully show you there is some hope. Um, so I'm going to do what Midnight Oil call taking the temper of the times. I want to talk for a bit about uh, why we see such hostility toward universities. And uh, a hostility, you can, you can wonder about when it started. Some people talk about Brexit, others the inauguration of Donald Trump. Uh, some talk about what's happened in Australia uh, with Pauline Hanson and the rise of angry independence, as it were. Um, but unambiguously, there's hostility toward governments and elites and experts and educational institutions. Um, James Dean, of course, played a rebel without a cause. And today, a lot of this debate seems about anger without focus. It seems that people are angry without necessarily having a particularly compelling reason why. But their anger is real and it's having an effect. Um, here's what the President of the United States says about Berkeley, uh, University of California, Berkeley, um, that if it doesn't do what he thinks it should do, uh, he should cut off all federal funding, which is a bit of a hoot because Berkeley gets only 7% of its budget from the federal government, but you get the idea. Um, and we've seen this a lot, uh, both in the, U in the US and in the UK. Um, and here in Australia, I think we're going to cop, we have cop some of it, and we're going to cop a whole lot more. We don't have the ferocity of Trumpism or of anti-European sentiment as in Britain, but we do have very equivocal attitudes uh, about the work of universities and about those charged with supporting the sector. Uh, think for a minute about these three ministers, our three most recent ministers. Uh, each of them, from different sides of politics, tried to engineer significant cuts to higher education, uh, and each of them justified those cuts, at least in part, by attacking universities. And in doing so, they fed the lack of trust that we now see in such of our society. Um, here in Australia, but even more pointedly in the United States and in Britain, universities are facing the charge of being privileged and wealthy, of receiving too many favours from the public purse. Now, perhaps this is understandable, um, given the long history of universities and their uh, expansion over the recent generation. I mean, let me give you an example, real estate. Over many centuries, through benefaction and investment, Universities have acquired significant cash and land holdings, and particularly older universities. In England, it was rumoured at one time that a pilgrim could walk between Oxford and Cambridge, which is about 100 kilometres, without ever leaving land owned by a college. It was never entirely true, but in 2015, the combined wealth of the Oxford colleges alone was estimated at £4.1 billion and that included 37,000 acres of the best land in England. The same year, the published accounts for the University of the University College London, UCL, which of course is an exempt charity, so it pays no taxes, uh, had to declare for insurance value the value of their buildings just around Russell Square, and they're valued at 3.1 billion pounds. And if that sounds abstract and British, then here in the city of Melbourne, RMIT owns 6% of the Melbourne CBD, some 70 buildings scattered through the CBD. Uh, ANU's student accommodation portfolio was valued at over $500 million when it was privatised in August 2016. Um, the ANU in total was valued at $1.4 billion and the University of Melbourne's current valuation is just a tad shy of $5 billion. So here is wealth, unambiguously, accumulated in a time of public austerity, bolstered in recent years by philanthropic campaigns which are designed to free universities from dependence on government. Now, universities like to be seen as above politics, 
And of course, we pledge allegiance to more than local concerns. We speak to a scholarly community. All those, all those articles in obscure journals, all that speaking to scholars in other places. Um, and uh, you know, that feeds in a curious way the resentment, the sense that we're not connected to community, we're not connected, we're not delivering back to Australia. And so you can hear a rising chorus of complaints about arrogant universities that resist government priorities, that value research over teaching, that don't address community ambitions. And this is the basis of the criticisms. And in Britain and in Australia, higher education ministers have not held back. They've labelled universities as inefficient, with overpaid vice-chancellors and overly generous wages and conditions for staff in that time of austerity. Institutions, in short, that seem ripe for, quote, efficiency dividends. And even the core value of what we do, expert knowledge to be shared with students and the wider community, is devalued when, say, in Britain, the Justice Secretary, Michael Gove, declares that people in this country have had enough of experts, that somehow we don't even value what it is we produce. Isn't it good to know that the world is in the hands of those two men? <laughs> uh, and in case this sounds like uh, just a concern about sort of what's on Twitter, um, the, the eminent British economist, Alison Wolfe, or Baroness Wolfe, more accurately, uh, urges very careful thought about any further expansion of university places. She's worried that courses are expensive, that graduate outcomes are uncertain, and she's saying it's time to pull back from expanding the system. The first time we've begun to hear voices saying this, we've gone too far, it's time to come back. In Australia, Higher Education Minister Simon Birmingham has criticised university surpluses and he's described institutions as burgeoning bureaucracies which benefit from the rivers of gold. I'm sure you, you know, even today, are luxuriating in those very same rivers. Uh, the rivers of gold as student enrolments have poured in. And you have to wonder if this is what our champion in government thinks, the Minister for Education, what do our critics say? In such a climate, asks the uh, higher education analyst Simon Marginson, what greater good would be lost if universities closed tomorrow? That was once an unthinkable thought. How could you have a country without universities? These are institutions once praised for their trustworthiness and standing, but universities can no longer assume respect. A Pew Research poll from about July this year found that a majority of Republican voters in the United States, a majority, 58%, view colleges and universities as negative influences on their country. A majority of the people who elected Donald Trump feel universities are negative influences in their communities. And this is just another sign of the growing voter resentment against the perceived privilege of university graduates in their view of the world. The pollster, Nat Sil Nate Silver, argues that it wasn't economic disadvantage, but education levels that explain the shift of votes from uh, Democrats to Republicans in 2016. Um, and this is consistent with CNN polls, which show that Donald Trump received 71% of the votes of non-college educated white males. And they're expressing not just their preference for a political campaign, they're also expressing their anger against a world that's defined by graduates in which graduates are getting employment and they are not. And of course in Britain the divide is equally sharp with three out of four non-graduates voting to leave the European Union, three out of four. I don't think the reasons are mysterious. I think that people with college degrees, university degrees, uh, of course are creating jobs for other people with university degrees, are creating a world in which those without uh, graduate qualifications are feeling cut out, are feeling disadvantaged, are feeling unwanted, and that is the basis of the resentment. It feeds into existing social divides. It's fueled by the collapse of vocational courses, by the eclipse of apprenticeships, by the destructions of all our earlier certainties about hard work and fairness and opportunity. Which would be fine if graduates were happy too but often they're not. They have accumulated unprecedented debt to take them into the world of employment, only to find that the jobs are not necessarily there and the housing is unaffordable. 
And the good life we promised graduates, come and study with us and we will give you the good life, can seem elusive. And that's why in Australia, as in Britain, we're seeing signs of growing political impatience with the autonomy of universities and their unwillingness to bend to government imperatives. Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull has criticised the priority of universities, particularly those with strong research records. Universities, he said, pay too much attention to peer review and not enough to local industry. Everyone I talk to, said the Prime Minister, believes that the problem is academics. Their, in their incentives are very much associated with publish or perish. And so I guess it was no surprise that Malcolm Turnbull's 2017 budget announced significant cuts to university funding. Now, that measure is now caught in the Senate, who knows? Who knows who's e even still in the Senate? But uh, before the year is out, I suspect those cuts will come through my EFO. Um, politicians, and not just Malcolm Turnbull, have increasingly shown their hostility to tertiary education. Why should everyone else pay for your expensive university degree, asked one senator earlier this year, making the point that he wanted to cut all public funding to universities. And as in Britain, politicians have used vice-chancellorial salaries to create anger against the university sector. Um, really, if you're a vice-chancellor, try not to be photographed with a Rolls Royce. <laughs> because you may end up on the front page of the Financial Times. Um, I feel for this guy, he's a car collector, it probably didn't cost a lot, he probably lovingly restored it himself, but that photo will forever be used as a sign of uh, you know, who vice chancellors are. And given photos like this, given the public campaign, it's not hard to understand the frustration of elected politicians. I mean, universities pay no tax, yet they're remorseless and asking for more public money. They champion themselves as innovators, yet they resist political pressures for applied research and immediate impact. They're large and wealthy institutions. They chase international students. They drive up property prices. And hence the suspicion amongst politicians that universities have lost sight of real life. So I think this is an important debate. I don't think this is a passing moment. I think there's something profound going on here. And for universities, much is at stake. Could a future government, impatient with remote institutions, dissolve the universities and replace them with something better aligned to political imperatives? Now, governments, for example, might require institutions to only teach. They might demand that they be vocational. They might demand that they specialise in only a few areas, that they stay outside the rankings competition, that they serve local communities. And all of these would be attractive proposals for a government to bring forward. And the idea that the university might disappear entirely is not new. The legendary registrar of Warwick University, Michael Shattuck, made a similar observation in 1991, saying he could foresee universities being overtaken by rival sources of education. And one of those rival sources, of course, is private providers, and there are many of you in the room. Simon Marginson offered a similar analysis in 2001, reminding us that it took Henry VIII just five years to close down the English monasteries that have flourished for a thousand years and to claim all their accumulated capital for the state. Stoke enough resentment about privilege and the same fate could await our world. So, you can think about a bleak history of the future. Um, why might governments want to start thinking this way? And where might this take us? Well, I've talked a lot about governments, but let me now talk about private providers. Certainty for universities began to change in the 1990s, before we had the web, um, before we had internet. Uh, Peter Drucker in the early 1990s was already predicting that long distance learning would end familiar tertiary institutions. He was quoted in Forbes magazine as saying that universities won't survive, the future is outside the traditional campus, it's outside the traditional classroom, distance learning is coming on fast, he said. And if he was saying that in the early 90s, it's now the ubiquitous universal message that we're about to be wiped out. The Washington Post recently predicted a profound structural and economic shift in favour of employers, students and parents. And the Economist likewise recently predicted the inevitable, the inevitable uh, reinvention of the university. 
And all of them rely on this idea that we're so familiar from IT in Silicon Valley. The idea of creative destruction. The idea that all these familiar industries will be wiped out by, um, by internet. Think about book publishing, video rental stores, matchmaking. All of them are folded under new technologies. And, and you can buy whole iPads full of texts about the imminent disruption of universities. A teaching model with a, with a millennium of history, we hear, is about to vanish. And uh, it's going to be replaced, so we keep getting told, by the entrepreneurs from Silicon Valley, who become a symbol of sort of permanent undermining and reinvention of everything we, knew, we know. Now, uh, economists in the room will recognise that this is, is an old trope. It comes from Joseph Schumpeter who argued that markets are never stationary. They evolve constantly with emerging and improving technologies. The old is always overthrown as new inventions, new forms of transport, new competitors demolish existing markets and create new ones. And it might surprise you to know that Schumpeter developed this idea not thinking about IT, he was thinking about the railways. And he was thinking about a particular railway, the Illinois Central Railway. And the example he took was really simple. Before the railway arrived, Chicago was a thriving town, a growing town, uh, and around it was market gardens, small market gardens, people making a mozza. They were doing really well because they were close enough that they could ship their produce into Chicago and sell it in the markets, but uh, Chicago was far enough away from any other major centres that no one else could afford to bring in food at a distance. And so they did very nicely, thank you, until the 1850s when the railway arrived. The Illinois Central Railway turned up. Suddenly, suddenly new tracks could open up whole bits of land and they could ship in food at a fraction of the cost of putting it in a cart and bringing it into the local market, which is how it had been done until then. The cost of freight fell to just a few cents a tonne and that killed the local turnpikes, the local canal trade, all of the old ways of transport. Once the train line arrived, everything changed. Suddenly, large and efficient enterprises from the south could ship food up to Chicago and sell it at premium prices. In creating this new market, they destroyed all of these communities around Chicago. That's the idea of creative destruction. It's not all one way. It's not that everything is killed. It's just that new markets kill old markets. And let me give you a more university example of that the town of Oxford, which you may have heard of, it's slightly north of London. Uh, the professors of Oxford, the dons of Oxford, opposed the railway coming to their town. And they opposed it, and I quote, because easy access to London might tempt improper marriages. Uh, <laughs> all those undergraduates getting on a train on Friday night. Um, and so they opposed the railway, but they lost the fight. And in 1844, Oxford got its first railway. And just as in Chicago, there were winners and there were losers. And I'm going to show you the group that lost, because you've never heard of them. These are the fisher, fisher folk of Oxford. For a thousand years, they had caught fish in the rivers around Oxford, the Isis and elsewhere, and they had sold them to the colleges. Um, not very good fish, sold at inflated prices. They had had a very good life. Here's a lovely photograph of them about the time the railway arrived suddenly you could bring fish in from major centres at a fraction of the cost that these people in Oxford could develop it and this trade vanished along with the canal traffic and everything else that until then had fed Oxford and instead a whole lot of new industries moved into the town and what had been a medieval town isolated by distance suddenly became connected to the world and very different. This was captured in one of the great paintings of the 19th century uh, just uh, exhibited for the first time the year uh, that the railway reached Oxford, 1844. It's J.M. Turner's uh, brilliant rail, steam and speed, the great Western Railway. And it's a, it's a stunning picture if you ever see it. It was put up at the Royal Academy. It, it sort of shocked London. Um, what you can't see from a distance, but is enormous fun, is there's a tiny hare that's standing on the, tra on the tracks. And you have to assume it's about to get <laughs> obliterated by the train, because 
This is the great Victorian image of unstoppable progress. Through driving rain, a train is rushing across a bridge. It's powerful, it's irresistible, and it's going to be fatal, I suspect, to that hair and to anyone else who wants to stand in its tracks. The new machines rip open the settled world, a blur of steam and mist hurtling into the future. Now, I tell you all this to say we're living this again because here's Silicon Valley and it has the same view of creative destruction that it is about to make public, large public universities redundant. No more campuses everywhere, no need to fund academics to do research and all those other expensive and boring things. Instead, the web can fund the university of the future. And let me put a face to this. This is Sebastian Thrun. He was a professor of computer science at Stanford University. He offered the first MOOC in the world. It was unbelievably successful. And he saw a good thing. He knew a good thing when he saw it. Uh, and he left Stanford University to found a company he called Udacity. And Udacity would sell degrees online. And he was very upfront. Um, I will do this at a fraction of the cost of going to universities and in 50 years time, he said there'll only be 10 universities left in the world and presumably his would be one of them. Uh, and he offered what he called nano degrees. Nano degrees were, you know, why spend four years studying something, uh, which is the American standard? Why not just come and spend six weeks and study um, programming of, of, uh, for Android for Google? Um, and then uh, get a job with Google, which is what he offers. Come to Silicon Valley, do my short courses, and then we'll get you straight into employment. And when you want to get promoted, you come back and do another one, and we'll upgrade your skills, and in time we'll give you a degree that reflects this stackable bunch of qualifications you've got. So what he did is took apart the traditional degree, not just that he's going to deliver online, he wasn't any more than expected to turn up year after year. So um, America already had big online universities, of which Phoenix is the largest in the world, uh, and um, he took it one step further. Now, Phoenix is a great example. It's been around for a very long time, 1976, in fact, but it really only came into its own in the 2000s when the, te when the web enabled it to reach out quickly. Phoenix offers practical degrees. You can't study theology or philosophy with Phoenix, but you sure can do medical administration uh, accounting and so on, and that's their business model. They have 600,000 people enrolled. Um, and they're also small startups. This is one from San Francisco, it's called Minerva, uh, and it, it's trying to take on the Ivy League. It offers high end qualifications, um, and it offers them using a standardized curriculum that you can take anywhere in the world, which means it doesn't need professors or classrooms or libraries or anything expensive like that. Um, and yet it claims it can offer a qualification as good as any you would get anywhere else. And so there are a whole range of these companies now. They are challenging higher education in a way we've never seen before. The head of Kaplan, whose name is Andrew Rosen, uh, predicts that in 25 years' time, no one will care where you go to university because you'll pick up bits of your degree from all sorts of places and you'll put them together in a sort of blended qualification and that will be the future but you can never go too far. Well, you can actually. Um, the founder of PayPal, one of the founders, a man called Peter Thiel, uh, decided to take this logic just a one step further. He said, why are you going to university at all? If you can get into Stanford, you've already made your point. You don't need to turn up. You've already shown you're bright enough. It's just a credential. And so he offers Thiel fellowships, $100,000 to not go to university. That is, you turn up with your certificate showing that you got into Harvard or Stanford or somewhere, and then he pays you not to go on the grounds that you'd be much better using your time starting a company. And this means that thousands and probably tens of thousands of young people across America every year now apply to not go to university. Um, so we're in a very different place. I'm, I'm, going, to, um, I'm going to skip the whole next section because it's not going to work. <laughs> in time, which is to say, well, what are we going to do in response? And what we're going to do in response is engage. We actually have to now talk to our communities in ways we haven't before. We're actually going to have to um, change the relationships we have with students, with communities. Um, we're going to have to be seen to be deeply embedded in the community if we are going to win back the trust that's been lost. But I do not in the slightest despair. It seems to me um, that the patterns in Australia, as in America, show that despite all these other offerings, 
Most students still want the full experience of study. They want to be in a place where there are other students like them. They want to be in a place where they can rub up against great minds. They actually want a chance to engage. And as long as we can get that part of it right, and Tex is a big part of doing that right, um, we can, I think, fight back as a public sector. We can find a place. Uh, there is a rationale for what we do. It's about the next generation. It's about the importance of education. It isn't about to go away, even if it's going to change form. We are all busy reinventing our institutions, taking on all of this technology that's emerged and giving it a new place. And we've got a way to go in doing that. But actually, that's our future. It's what we do, um, mended, augmented, supplemented, and improved by all of the inventiveness of Silicon Valley. We don't have to stand in front of that train. We can actually be on it. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Lynn's derailed my timings. Did you get that? Thank you. Um, but that's good because it's very interesting and I expect lots of engagement now. So we're going to run straight to the questions, if you don't mind, Glenn. How many global standard research intensive universities can or should Australia sustain? Does your view impact how we define a university in Australia? Okay, so that's a fantastically loaded question, you know, a chance to, <laughs> to really dump on colleagues. Um, we're very fortunate in Australia. We have one of the great university systems, and it shows in the global rankings. And you know, people talk about top 100, top 200, top 500. Um, given that there's 7,000 or more accredited universities around the world, to have anyone in the top 500 is, I think, a fabulous achievement, and most Australian universities are there. So I think we start from a great place. The big issue for Australia is that we lack diversity is that our institutions are so similar that we have so few alt you know, alternatives for institutions. And that's, I think, the future battle. It isn't about how many of them are globally significant, it's about why are they all so similar. Why do we have 41 law schools in this country? And if you thought that was a loaded question, there's this one. Too much university wealth is localised at the top with the few and bias to those doing research and not delivering teaching outcomes, should we redistribute? Okay. So a complicated question and not a simple <laughs> answer off possible. Uh, too much university wealth is accumulated at the top, it says. Well, it is true that a older, the older university your university is, the more likely it is to have wealth. That's true in every other asset of life and it's true in university sector. Um, and it is, and I'm someone who's had the privilege of leading Griffith University, one of the youngest universities in the country, uh, and you can feel the difference. I remember arriving at Melbourne and they showed me the law school and I realised the law school building had cost more than the entire new campus that we just opened for Griffith University. And that's, that's the reality of our system. Um, and it does go to the question of if everyone has the same aspirations, then by definition it's going to be unfair because someone, some can do better than others. The question is, should we all have the same aspirations? Or, in fact, would specialisation give us a better way of equalising the effort across institutions than saying that everyone's going to be comprehensive, everyone's going to offer the full range of disciplines, and then we're going to be disappointed that a number of institutions struggle to do that as effectively as they would like. 